We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. into tailgate austin gale here with mike renner ready to rip it up on spotify review day big spotify review day but there's bigger things afoot we're gonna talk college football playoff and switch it up a bit our nfl game by game previews gonna go quick with those there's not a lot of good games down the stretch but still should be fun at the back end of the show though auburn's roger mccreary and uab's alex wright both join the show make sure you tune in for those interviews at the back end let's get it Mike, I came to you, and we'll get to Spotify. I came mm. to you and I said, I'm really, really fat, and I need help. And we were on these trips listening to some audiobooks, right? Yeah. And one of them's Creatures of Habit or whatever, some habit book. Yeah. Written by the King of Habits or whatever. <laughs> look look it up. Just type habits in your Google search bar, and it'll come Here, up. Let me actually find what it's called. But here. we are listening Continue. to this book, and we we're just taking notes, right? Taking notes, taking names. And now that the tailgate tour is semi-closed, we're obviously going to the Big Ten National Championship Big Ten National Championship, Big Ten Championship in Indy for Michigan, Iowa, but it's relatively close, right? We're not freaking buzzing every single weekend. I gave you a habit contract. They yes. talk about it. A habit contract where if I don't meet these certain habit goals, I have to pay you money. Yeah. One of them is I have to send you a picture of my scale, me on the scale, and me at the gym every single day. Mm -hmm. Every where single day, seven days a week. Each picture missed. Two pictures a day is $10 to your Venmo. You can see that. Your public Venmo, people can see it. People yeah. will know. People can follow along. Then... If I'm not, there's a handful of like weight goals to get down to. And if I'm not at certain weight goals, a dollar for every pound over all that shit. It's going to be, you know, I'm going to be on here. You know, people are always like, Mike is so attractive, whatever. I'm going to be the guy who's taking over. No one says that. I'm a lot of people say that, Mike. Well, to me. Anyway, I'm going to be taking over on the habit contract. The, I, I appreciate you signing it. The though. book is called Atomic Habits. We listened to a number of audiobooks because of, you know, driving around We're grinding the Midwest tape. here. This one was great. I, I truly, I, I think one of the bigger takeaways I got from the book was uh, you're, you you started doing habit contracts. I started doing uh, identities. So mm -hmm. instead of saying I want to clean my apartment more, say you want you want to be a clean person. Yeah, that's the biggest one I'm trying to do right now. I want to be a clean person. So you have like, to when match you're a clean your identities. Person, yeah. So like when you're a clean person, you clean clean apartment. It's not the other way around. And so I'm also want to be a healthy person. So mm -hmm. instead of losing weight, I just want to be healthy. So I think those are two big takeaways I got from a book like that. But I'm glad you realized that you're a fat. We were all talking about it behind your back. I know. But we wanted you to realize on your own because then it would have more power. Exactly. We told you you weren't going to internalize it yet. So. And honestly, I encourage that, right? It motivates me. Yeah. It motivates me. People will talk shit behind my back. Let's get to your Spotify and review. Number one listen podcast for me was Oral History of the Office. It's embarrassing. It's only 12 episodes It's also long. not surprising. You have a tattoo That's from true. a obscure office quote on your thigh that you got this year. I did. I did. So, anyway, but then my top songs, Glass Animals. Um, what is it? Heat Waves. Heat Waves by Glass Animals. That was Animals. mine too. <laughs> it was, that was the song of the summer, man. That was an absolute banger. Yeah. Uh, mine are kind of embarrassing, honestly. <laughs> my top podcast was Pardon My Take. And then move the sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks, and then tailgate number three. I have went back and listened to a few of ours. No big nice. deal. Um, let's see. This was all over tw Twitter. I, the fa I would never post these out to the public. I mean, we're never. just talking about it here, just because we're shooting the shit, chopping it up. But like the people who like go and post it on Twitter, I'm like, what do you ex what do you Pieces want me of to shit, say? Honestly. Like, what do you want me to say? Um, but yeah, heat waves. Uh, I don't even want to say the rest of mine. Honestly. Don't. They're Please embarrassing. don't. No one cares. What, <laughs> I my, remember my, my, my top one last year was Porn Star Dancing, which is like an old song, but I would listen to it. I don't know why I listened to it. I would disgusting. listen to the gym. It's a funny, it's a good song. My takeaway was is that I think porn sites or OnlyFans should do the same thing. Yes. Your yes. 2020, your 2021 wrapped up on porn site of choice, aka or and or OnlyFans. And you get genre, you get 
all you know your stars yeah. and it you comes like. right at the back end Bukaki of no nut november year. yeah no nut november you're like oh let's fucking celebrate this with a bang this came out december 1st i was gonna say Spotify. the fact that they haven't stolen the idea when like everyone steals every other social media or social platforms idea is kind of a great insane i think thing. if you're a premium subscriber to one of the sites they should do it they might right? it shouldn't come for free i don't want for free i want to pay for that service yeah. I well i don't want porn so i wouldn't know about oh yeah same of course not that's what i'm saying for people who do it would be interesting but um, i'm trying to help you guys out yeah all, like our listenership. All right. Let's get into some of this college football playoff stuff. Can you get your react? Can I get your reactions to the college football playoff? Top Unfazed. Six? That's my reaction to the top six. I thought they Unfazed. nailed it. I thought they nailed it. The yeah, top six too. is nailed. You know, they have Georgia, Michigan, who beat Ohio State, jumps to two, Bama three, Cincy four, Oklahoma State, which I think with a Cincy loss and a Bama lo- or, or a Bama loss, they get in. And then they have Notre Dame. You're fighting Irish, who are without a coach right now okay. at number six. That was the only thing that I thought the committee got wrong, where that was uh, ridiculous coming out of it, was, what's his name, Gary Barta, coming out and saying GB. that they're going to take into account the fact that Notre Dame had a coaching change, and that might hurt them? How does that even fucking make sense? It doesn't. It could be better. You don't know. It's like an unknown that should neither detract nor help you. Like, literally the guys who have called every single play this year, offensive coordinator or defense coordinator, are, are still there. there. So... The fact they lost Brian Kelly should not be factoring into the stupid decision of this committee. They've done dumber things, though, so I'm not too surprised. But I'll just say, if Alabama loses handily to Georgia, they do not belong in the playoffs. I'm just going to say that right now. I think if they lose at all. You think if they lose at all? So Because they're not going to do Georgia-Bama 1-4. They're not going to yeah. do that matchup again. Like, say Bama squeaks out a three-point loss, yeah, and you drop them down to four because you have to move a Cincinnati up or whatever— that would be absurd because then Georgia has to play Bama again. Or they could do some dumb shit. This would be the dumbest shit. Look at that camera here. Bama loses by three points. Cincinnati wins. They keep Bama at three. Even at two losses, they don't move them. And that way, so they don't have to see Bama Georgia one oh, for four. They'll do but that. They, and they might. That's, that's the only way I see Bama getting in, right? I don't. If Bama does not win, they should be out because they should drop the four at yeah. the worst. And you're not going to drop Bama to four. And like you said a thousand times, make Georgia play Bama again to prove they're the best team in the country. I think Bama loses, they're out. So here's what has to happen for no D- Notre Dame. It does, that Georgia-Bama game doesn't matter for Notre Dame, in mm-hmm. my opinion. What matters is they need Cincy to lose, yeah. and they need Oklahoma State to lose. I think if Cincy and Oklahoma State loses, Notre Dame goes from 6-4, to four, and it goes Georgia. It doesn't matter. Bama's out. You can move, you can move Oklahoma State to 3 and you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. If Bama loses, you move another team up. But like, I do think Notre Dame can win as long as both Cincinnati and Oklahoma State lose. It doesn't matter with the Bama-Georgia game. Yeah. I, uh, I'll just say this. Like, people like pumping this Bama train up for like if if they lose to georgia they should still get in they beat one team in the top 25 right now the college football playoff rankings one like it's not like this this is not your mother's alabama team Mm. mother's alabama it's not the alabama team for the last few years it's just not straight up hasn't been they beat lsu by six they beat arkansas by seven and they beat auburn in three ot's Mm -hmm. i think it was four four ot's that that's who they are right now a team that is squeaking out wins against average SEC teams. They they are not like if they get handled by Georgia, very possible, or even just lose like a, a touchdown. You can't put a two loss team in. Like our, Texas A&M is a four loss team. That's if, who they lost to. If the, I think the worst thing the committee could do, the worst thing, is that thing I said where if Bama loses by three, maybe even six, they keep them at three. So they avoid the one to four matchup again, yeah. but keep them in the playoff for the ratings and for whatever. That would legitimately be the worst thing I've ever seen. I don't think they're going to do it, but they could. I don't think they're going to do it. I think if Bam loses, they should be out and they're going to be out and they're going to move. I will just Cincy say, up. They're going to move Oklahoma. I am glad, and because I, I was a little worried about this, I was a little worried that Ohio State was still, still going to be ahead of Notre Dame after this past weekend. Oh, really? I was. I was because that. I mean, we've seen crazier things. So thankfully, that did not happen. Let's get to picking these games. All right. Before we do, can I can I shout out X Chair? Yeah. We got to. Re- so X Chair reached out to us. And they said, "Buddy, you guys are moving chairs like you're moving something else fast. Working from home is more important than ever now." Optimize your home office with an X chair and many of our accessories to enhance your focus, productivity, energy, and comfort. Once you feel the customized support of X chairs, patented, dynamic, variable, lumbar, 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 there's no going back. It's all in the LMX massage and temperature regulation. You thought you didn't need that in your chair, you do. Exclusively designed and made for X chair. With versatile comfort and extraordinary design, X chair fits literally any space. High performance, quality engineering extreme comfort those are all reasons i love my x chair now i can't i literally can't wait to be at work and sometimes even if i'm not working i'll go into the office like 3 a.m and i'll sit in the x chair just to get that feeling 
literally just gets that feeling. Now is the perfect time to purchase an X-Share. Why? Because now is the only time X-Share goes on sale all year. That's right, on Black Friday and Cyber Monday weekend. Save up to $500 on X-Share, four days only, on Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend. Go to xsharetailgate.com. That's letter X, chair, tailgate, T-A-I-L-G-A-T-E.com. X-Share has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort and... You can find finance your purchase for as little as $25 a month. Go to xchairtailgate.com and save up to $500 on xchairtailgate.com. If you're watching on YouTube, check out the link in the description below. Let's pick some fucking games. Oh, yeah. Baylor, Oklahoma State. I'm all in on Baylor upset. This is the one. This is I, the think one I think Baylor's going to upset. I think yeah. Baylor's coming in. They're going to upset. You look at some of the green line projections at PFF. They like that move as well. There's a little cheddar, little Val on the Baylor money line. I think I want to chase it. I think I want to chase it. I like Baylor. I love what Aranda has done for that program. You could say, and I think someone else said this too on game day, Baylor and Michigan are two of the programs that have improved the most. I think Baylor goes in to Oklahoma State against Gundy and takes a dub. Yeah. Baylor defense has been cooking. Held Oklahoma 14 points a few weeks back. Um, Dave Aranda is the real deal as defense coordinator. I, I think that they obviously have met already. Oklahoma State beat them the first time around. It's tough to beat a team twice in a season. Yeah. So that is my thoughts on that. You skipped a game on this slate. Well, yeah. The Pac-12 championship, do we give a shit? No. Mountain West championship. Okay. San Diego State favored by six over Utah State. Utah State, who who currently has the FBS leader in receiving yards in Devin Tompkins. That's a game to watch. Starts at 3 o'clock. I know you guys are going to watch Bama, Georgia at 4. But if you want the real action, Utah State, San Diego State, San Diego State favored, favored by six. It's going to be what you need, and, and you're just going to need it. Let's go to Georgia Bama, though. Georgia favored by six and a half on a neutral site, but it's in Atlanta. So Georgia's going to be there. So, yeah. Romping. Neutral ish. This so. is the first time Alabama has been a dog. They're six and a half point dogs mm -hmm. since 2015. I'm not going to look the camera in the face and doubt saving. I'm not. I won't. I know this Alabama team is not your mother's Alabama team, to quote you. I know they haven't played well. It's I know they mother's. went to four OTs with Auburn. You tell me Saban's not going to show up? You tell me Saban's not going to show up. Bryce Young's the highest graded quarterback in the country. I am all in. Georgia's been high and mighty on this pedestal all year long. Best team they beat was Clemson, and Clemson's been shit this year. Here comes Bama. Here comes Saban. I'm not going to sit down on Saturday in Indy and root against Georgia. I'm not going to do it. I mean, root against Bama. I won't do it. I'm going Bama to cover the six and a half and win. Here's why this is not your mother's Alabama team, though. 57th in pass blocking grade so far this season among FBS teams. Their offensive line's not – they have Evan Neal, and then that's kind of it in terms of, like, real-deal talent on their offensive line. And they are going up against the best defensive line I've seen in modern college football history. They're insane. Those guys are not only talented football players. Like they are freaks of nature from a size-speed perspective all up and down that defensive line. Like they had, we talked about why uh, Jermaine Johnson had to transfer or else he wasn't going to see the field. That's how good this defensive line is. So that's going to be the matchup of the game. Now, obviously, I like Bryce Young. I think he's one of the best quarterbacks in college football, if not the best. But I don't think he's he's not going to have the situation that he's had literally all the rest of the season. I think Georgia wins, and wins going away. Wow. My prediction was, they gave me what I do on the uh, – Quote graphic. I got a quote graphic to a 24-13 prediction. That's what I think it's going to be. 24-13. I picked 23-20. Bama. So the total goes under. It's a 50-point total. Houston at Cincy. I don't know how this line is 10 and a half. I don't think it should be That's that. like the same it was against SMU. And they did blow them up. And they did blow them up. Clayton Toon, though, is on fire of late. He's like the highest graded quarterback in college football over the last four weeks. I, I do feel that this line is a bit too big. For AAC. I think Cincinnati wins, right? But I don't think they cover the numbers back that. 92% of the cash bet on this game has been bet on Houston plus 10.5, and, and I ride with that. Green Line also has value on that figure. I'm riding with Green Line. I'm riding with Houston to cover. Bearcats win. I like Houston to cover, too. And we've said, I've said all year, since he's got real deal NFL talent. Like, that's what separates them, this group of five team, from... UCF a few years ago from these other teams that have made noise at you know lower levels of college football but then when they go up a level they don't have the physicality to match because they don't have the dudes since he does but you know who else does Houston Logan Hall line defensive line top 75 prospect on the PFF draft board Marcus Jones at corner the kick returner as well best kick returner in the country also a top 75 player on the PFF draft board they have guys as well and like I said 
opposite side of the ball has been humming. So yeah, I, I think ten and a half is a it's a big line for the probably the two these are the two best group of five teams at the moment. Granted that BYU is not technically five. anything. Yeah, they're independent. Independently trash. I mean, Notre Dame's not group of five either. Uh, which is independently trash. Yeah. I mean, Brian Kelly didn't want to stay with Notre Dame as a top six team in the country. <laughs> Did you watch the leaked video of his address? Barstool, I think, tweeted. Oh, out. yeah, yeah. I don't think it was that egregious. I, I, the only thing I found hilarious is he said it's a sad day. But I was like, no, buddy, you just signed an $11 million a year. If yeah. No one's sad, buddy. <laughs> if, you, that, 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 if you're sad, you need to fucking figure it out. I'm sad. I'm sad. You're sad. Players are sad. It's not a sad day for you. You're probably buzzing. The boys, I, he's down in Baton Rouge just dish, 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 yeah. dish, 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 dish. Listen to glass animals. He weighs. I did love that there was another down bad Sooners tweet. You saw it. Oh, my the, God. This one that said, after doing a cost of living calculation. This guy needs help. Using Lincoln Riley's reported salary versus a salary at OU, which private schools don't need to actually like report actual salaries, by the way. Uh, public schools do. He's making roughly $2 million less per year when it boils down. Just a fun fact, he says, and then he puts a bunch of emojis after that, which like, if that's true, which I'm guessing it's probably also not, it's a hilarious cell phone that he wanted to take $2 million less to get the hell out of Oklahoma to go to USC. Yeah. It's saying that he wanted to get out is what he's saying. So uh, I love the emoji you said. Unfortunate down bad. He uses like oh, shrug emoji, fans. smile emoji, wacky tongue emoji. Although did you see there was a private jet that went from South Bend to... Uh, Oklahoma City? For what? The flight tracker? I don't know. I don't know what that was. That oh, one got wow. me a little worried. Is that Freeman? I don't know. You don't know? Dude, no way. They, Freeman goes to Oklahoma. That'd be insane. I don't know. They have to do everything they can to keep Freeman. I know. The players want Freeman. Kyle Hamilton has a podcast with some of the bros. Yes. And he came out and said, he's like, I want Freeman. If, if Hamilton wants him, you got to keep him, I yeah. think. It doesn't make sense. If Hamilton, Freeman should be like, hey, or Notre Dame's like, hey, you come back to school, we'll hire Freeman. <laughs> I like that. Scratch your I like I'll that. scratch my I like that. No, I'll scratch something. He should go, though. Iowa, Michigan, another 10 and a half point line. Michigan favored by 10 and a half. Green line really likes Iowa. Yeah, I know. And well, you mentioned this before we started recording, but Iowa's defense isn't shit. And PFS ratings are the number one defense in the Big Ten. Really highly graded corners. They don't have like that much of a pass rush, but that Van Valkenburg guy has gotten Van a lot Valken. of pressure. I think this is going to be a different game. Some people are like, oh, there is a blowout, blowout season. The total is 43 and a half for a reason. I think this is going to be tight, man. It's going to be like 2017 or even like 17 13. I think it's going to be a small, small total. Mm -hmm. And one of these wins that I, I do think Michigan wins, but I would be, if I was a betting man, I would be betting Iowa to cover. Back to back blowouts would be insane. This Iowa offense does stink. I'm not saying it doesn't stink. Yeah. But this defense is good enough, I think, to keep the game low. And if it's low on a 10.5 point spread, it's hard to cover those big numbers on low totals. Yeah, this feels like Big Ten football. Like this feels like what it looked like when Michigan played Penn State, mm -hmm. where it's just two, and I'm this is going to be a shout out Ohio State, but two well coached defenses Good limiting luck. each other's offenses. Like yeah. it, it'll be a defensively dominated game because like I was going to actually be able to somewhat stop the run, unlike Ohio State did, which was just why Michigan just kept pouring it on and why Ohio State just had no chance to come back. I mean, Hassan Haskins had five TDs. Yeah, so I, I think at that point it's going to look like what Michigan looked like against Rutgers and Michigan looked like against Penn State and more closely related to the Michigan State game. So, can we commit to an Ann Arbor trip? Lot at that point. Can we commit to an Ann Arbor trip in basketball season? Oh, basketball season. Just go back to Ann Arbor, watch a basketball game. Dave, producer Dave, said Ooh. he could hook us up. I wonder if um, when, when they're uh, playing Notre Pro Day is. Oh, maybe go up for the Pro Day. Yeah. I just want to get fun. back. I miss it. Yeah. How excited are you for Dave to be in the press box? So Dave went to Michigan. Yeah. Die hard. This Michigan guy bleeds. Man. This guy bleeds blue. Bleeds it. Like John Harbaugh's favorite fan. Or Jim Harbaugh, excuse me. I don't know how he's going to act in the press box. We got press box seats. Can't you cheer. can't cheer in the press box. He's going to be violently just like, I don't know what this, this thing is right here, but this is what's going to be. I know what that thing is. Um, I will say, the one thing I did love about going down south to the press box is that like LSU, Alabama... People were cheering. Oh, no, fans, true. LSU was Fans were cheering. Like, the guys next to us at LSU were literally up. Standing and clapping. It was incredible. What do you think this indie press box spread's going to be? That's what I'm looking forward to. Oh, well, my God. But obviously not being a big-time Michigan hater, that's going to be far more exciting to me than the actual game. 
but oh, geez, I, so I, I do want and then watching David try to contain himself if Michigan should be blowing out Iowa wow. we'll or containing himself if they're getting dogged in the post all right that's gonna do it for the college football playoff reactions picks we're on to the NFL and like I said at the top here do this a little bit different skip over some of these games with widespreads teams that are out of the playoff hunt it's just bad content it's bad at content. this point in the season it's bad content if you're like go back to go back to the previews every game I want you to spend an hour on each team Hit me up via DM. Yeah. Send. I'll send you a screenshot. I've had so many people ask for screenshots of me dancing on that table. I did too. Infinitely. I sent them out. I've sent them out too. Uh, I have a few more to go. I'll send them out to you guys, but I have sent a lot out. It's, I it's interesting because picking the best- I said they can make memes off them too if they want. Picking the best screenshot of screen. the video is tough, right? Because there's a handful of moves I'm, I'm breaking out that are just not like super yeah, great. Yeah, it gets like rated R at one point. It does. It does. <laughs> Which- it's rough to see. Cowboys Saints. Yeah, we just, and we also want to spend more time on like mailbags at this point. We'll oh, yeah. Some more of you guys' questions because it's getting towards that season where a lot of people are focused more on the spring, which is what I'm focused on too myself. Oh, yeah. Cowboys Saints, Thursday Night Football. I want to preview this one. Saints are four and a half point dogs at home. Likely to start Taysom Hill. I think they're likely to start Taysom Hill. They're trying to give it a go. I think if Taysom starts and if the Cowboys are still hurt, I think Amari Cooper was just lifted out of the COVID 19 list. If he plays and CeeDee Lamb plays, I think it's different. But the Cowboys go into this game wounded. Like Zeke is expect, you know, there's a lot of guys banged up. If they go in and you see like a an engaging inactive list, right? Engaging, a late inactive list that kind of scares you. I take Saints plus four and a half with Taysom starting. Now, CD Lamb's healthy, Mari Cooper's healthy, all these guys are healthy. And Cowboys on the road minus four and a half is my pick. I saw people upset about Tristan Hill. My, my cough button was held down actually. You're a piece of shit. Say <laughs> it that it's like stuck in the down. Say that again. I saw people upset about Tristan Hill getting a two game suspension and like making the point that other people have thrown punches. But I think to me, there's a big difference between throwing a punch in the heat of a game and literally starting a post game brawl. Like that has ceased to be like it's a completely different, I guess, mindset. Like in the heat of a game, you're literally hitting each other every other play. You can't punch a guy in post-game handshakes. Yeah. You just can't. Like, that NFL has to come down hard on it. It was like the LeBron thing. Like, yeah, LeBron, the guy getting, who was, who did he hit that got suspended two games uh-huh. when LeBron got suspended one? Yeah, LeBron deserves to be suspended. He was the instigator. But you cannot go over the top and react to a point that's going to start a whole team brawl. You yeah. can't. And so that was the thing that I didn't feel too bad. But I have no sympathy for Tristan Hill and his gator rolling ways. Tristan but, Hill, though, Got the re- suspension reduced to one because he sent in a video that shows John Simpson, the guy he punched, kind of instigated a little bit too. Yeah. So it got reduced to one. So he kind of showed he got instigated. The Max Crosby was ready to give him the smoke. But that was good. That was good. That was a good tangent. Who's your pick here? Uh, my pick is going to be the Cowboys. If they're healthy. Was, yeah. All right. How much time do you want to spend on Bucks Falcons? How little can we spend? <laughs> Cardinals <I'm> Bears. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, but the Falcons offense is just, they need Calvin Ridley back. I mean, they're 11 point dogs at home. I straight up need Calvin Ridley back. And I don't, I don't completely dislike them in this game because that's a monster line for a home team. And again, you throw out, can throw out a little bit for divisional matchups. It seems like they always get played closer than non divisional matchups. Love that. But they, their offense has just been so brutally inept. They just don't have the options. Like you're throwing. Hitch routes to Olamita Zacchaeus, asking him to win one on one. That's not his game. Like he's, you're trying to shoehorn. It's kind of looks like the Jags' offense right now, honestly, and just like you don't have the talent to run stuff. Bucks favored by eleven on the road. Like the only reason you're taking the Falcons is because the line is so big and it's a home team and it's a divisional rival. I will say they're going to be one of the more interesting teams to follow in the offseason, like what they do because they yeah. committed that next year to Matt Ryan. Is he a trade candidate? That's what I see could happen, right? Trade him away to a team that maybe can compete with him because he's not shit. I'd be curious to see if yeah if he's if they're like if he himself would be like open. Where would you rank Matt Ryan right now? Oh, God, don't do this to me. Um, QB sixteen, QB no, eighteen, no higher than that. Really. 13. I think and, dude, there are teams with a QB 13 that could do some numbers. Completely unscientific 13. That's your that's your model. Motto. Cardinals, Bears. Bears are seven. A lot of home dogs. Cardinals, Bears. Bears are seven and a half point dogs at home. Is Did we got confirmed reports that Fields is playing? Do we? I, I, don't, I don't think, think so. so. I don't think so. Um, do we have confirmed that Kyler Murray is going to play this week. We do. Kyler yeah. Murray, DeAndre Hopkins are not confirmed, but they are but practicing. They are practicing. All right. But Justin Fields, according to Pro Football Talk, will practice, but Andy Dalton is working with the starter. So it's going to be Dalton, Murray. And at that point, seven and a half, you're getting the hook, right? Like maybe you take the home dog with the hook. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I'll lean that. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll I'll take the home dog with the hook. Yeah, I like if Dalton's playing. I like the Bears to cover. Yeah, seven. Chargers Bengals. This is probably one of the bigger games of the weekend. This was supposed to get flexed on a Sunday night. Chris is walking around the office. Says, oh man, we could be in Cincy. You guys could get into the box. I could let you guys call a couple plays. He was crazy saying some crazy shit, but it ultimately didn't get um, put into the Cincinnati Bengals, which crazy. is better. Yeah, obviously better. Yeah, no, it's better because you have to have a West Coast team come East for the and one, play that's what at I was one saying. p.m. in the cold weather. I mean, it's not like better a for huge the advantage, yeah. but it's in it's an inherent advantage. And the Chargers, while the offense, I mean, the offense has been kind of sloppy, kind of up and down lately. Bengals. They're on the move, right? And Joe Mixon, how much they're running him is kind of insane. Yeah. Like they're rushing yeah. volume over expectations. Insane, but it's working. This offensive line is paving the way. Mixon's having a career year. However, I'm not picking the Bengals because every time I don't, oh. they win. I'm taking Chargers plus three and a win so Cincinnati can call one thing good in the city. We Do got... you really believe that or are you just doing that to keep up the bit? Because you got to really believe it. I really believe it. You really believe I it? I really just believe it. Justin Herbert Herbo is going to come into Cincy and dump Trump the Cincinnati Bengals. I'll just say, worth noting, 80% chance of rain here this weekend on Sunday, but also not cold, 57 high of 57. So from two perspectives, that means more of a running game, which favors the Bengals because we've said the Chargers run defense has been kind of cheeks. But... Joe Burrow on those baby hands trying to hold on to a ball oh, in the rain. Mm. You screw which one? Which which one's worse? Which one's worse? Imagine having know. nine I chance. Know, I can't. I don't know, Jim. I like the Bengals at home. Oh, wow. You're picking the Bengals despite the baby hands? Yeah, baby hands. He's going to fumble like six times now. <laughs> Quinn, what's your pick? Um, Fuck it. I'll go Bengals. I, I'm, go. Very ner- I'm very nervous about this game, though. Let's I'm nervous about every game. game. I'm nervous, nervous, I'm nervous game. about this game. Vikings-Lions plus seven. This game's going to suck. Yeah. It's in Detroit. Detroit's playing for the number one overall pick. They're playing for Aiden Hutchinson. This team is going to blow it all up after this offseason. I think they still keep Dan Campbell. And the Vikings, while they have had like some awful losses, and with Dalvin Cook out, I don't even think that's that big, you know, that big of a loss. I think Alexander Madison and Ken and Wongu can come in there and still have an efficient rushing attack. I think the Vikings go in and cover the number. I like the Lions to cover oh, home. Wow. It's a big spread. And I, think they can move the, I can move the ball. I think they can move the ball on the Vikings. I think this is going to be my next game, my upset of the week. Vikings still banged up up front, no DTs. And that Lions offensive line with the two tackles healthy has been pretty good at running football. Like they can create some holes up front. So there you go. A lot of big spreads and a lot of home dogs this week. That's why we're trying to run through these. This next pick, this team is a nine-point dog at home. And I'm picking them to win. But before I do, grades are grades and data are live for every single player who logged a snap last week. Go check out the highest grade players from week 13. You can get a PFF, PFF subscription for 40% off with promo code Cyber40. Use promo code Cyber40. You support PFF. You support Mike. You help him buy the Notre Dame shirts. Like, do you want Notre Dame? Do you want Mike to come on here wearing nothing? No. He needs to buy shirts. Cyber40. F- feed him. Dress him. Cyber40. Texans plus nine. I like them to win. I'm, I'm buying Terod Taylor. This is the game. Colts on the road. Go to Houston. Texans play better football than... Well, this is week one football for the Texans. They go against an indie team that, yeah, didn't beat the Bucks because they have the best run defense in the NFL. They find a way this week. I'm taking the Texans to win. I cannot get on board with you there. I, I Texans are just rank average across the board of their defensive line. Run defense, one of the lower graded run defenses in the NFL going up against Jonathan Taylor and this Colts offensive line just I'll take the te- the Colts even though it's on the road Colts cover. to cover too Colts cover fine Giants Dolphins yikes what was your take on all that stuff on Twitter today Tua Tungvaloa just an RPO guy this is his offense this is who he is I saw Benjamin Solak wrote a piece the ringer that's a good piece but talks about just kind of his limitations and what he can do within that offense that's all he has time for you know, yeah, it's like they're emphasizing that because it literally makes it so their offensive line doesn't have to pass protect. You know, it's yeah. like, but is it not also because to he's good at it? Yeah. He's good at it. I mean, like he he does not miss throws. We've talked about this. Like he's one of the more accurate quarterbacks in the league already. Um, his ball placement is fantastic, but like when he drops back to pass, he's got guys in his lap, and, and that's that's the biggest. That's the bigger question. It's like the rest of the passing offense is hit and miss and inconsistent because non-RPOs, he's under pressure like 45% of the time. You know, like that's the problem right there. I, I think Tua, for me, I would still try 
to build around Tua. I'm not blowing up Tua. I know there were some talks about him. Who's who's doing that? Who's, some people think he's shit. Well, I mean, obviously the they've wanted to get Deshaun Watson, but like they're not just going to trade him to go get anyone else besides Deshaun. You know, a guy yeah. who's already what about like Rodgers or some of these other teams. Yeah, like sure. By all means, trade any like young, not besides Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert. Like trade trade any guy to get a guy who you know is a stud. Sure, it's any unproven guy, but like they're not just going to go draft Matt Corral and say peace to a like that's not no. no. What's wild to me is this line is only three, and there are some injury rumors that Daniel Jones is kind of going to enter the week questionable with a neck injury, and if he sits and they play Mike Glennon. This line should be bigger than three. I think you take advantage of the line now and bet it at minus three. Knowing that Daniel Jones might not play. Yeah. I like the Dolphins. Eagles at Jets. Jets are six and a half point dogs at home. They don't have the hook under the key number seven. Are we fading Jalen Hurts or are we fading Zach Wilson? <sighs> Fuck, that's tough. I mean, I, I will fade the fact that the Jets offense sucks. And their defense is terrible. Yeah. Bottom five and EPA allowed per rush. Like they have not had any success against the run. Like Jalen Hurts can't create pressure. Jalen Hurts for as bad as he did play. And he didn't play well. Like those the turnovers, like they threw he threw away six points off turnovers, had seven more points dropped by Jalen Rager. Like it was fluky that they still didn't beat the Giants. Um and those two turnovers were not like egregious mistakes that he had. The one in right before the half and the one early on in the red zone. So I'll say that that's more of a fluke and that you'll see the Eagles offense back on track to a degree. I mean, the run game is about as good as it gets in the NFL right now. Them, Browns, Colts, that's like those are the top three rushing teams. So I still believe in that going up against this Jets defense. Jags at Rams. I don't know why I said defense like that. Defense like that. Defense. Jags at Rams. Rams are 12 and a half point favorites over the Jags at home. Has it gotten this bad for Urban? I think Urban gets blown out here. I think he calls Notre Dame. I think he does. <laughs> um, yeah, it's gotten this bad for Urb. No, he's not going to call Notre Dame. I mean, he, he might call Notre Dame. Notre Dame's not going to answer. He could be, no, Notre Dame will answer. Um, Notre Dame will You really answer. wouldn't want Urban Meyer to coach Notre Dame with as good as Urban Meyer's been in college. I know he's been a joke with the Jags, but he's an awesome college coach. I, if they hired him, I'd be excited. I'm just really? They're not really? They're not going to hire. Quote graphic. They hired him. I'd be graphic. excited. I mean, there's a lot of guys they'd hire. I'd be excited. Just, it's like. Who? Hope season. Fickle. Freeman. Like, I'm going to be excited whoever they, they hire. That's just the way the nature of the beast. But they're, they're not going to hire him. I said this right. I looked at the camera in the eye, face, or whatever you called the camera the, earlier. But um, I will say about this game 12 and a half is a lot with the way the Rams' offense looked to the way. It's just a lot with the way the Rams offense looked away. And like the Jaguars, for all the shortcomings, have been somewhat okay on, on the defense side of the ball. Yeah. Like they held the Bills. Uh they held the Colts to twenty. They've had games where they didn't get absolutely shit tanked. But at the same time Shit tanked? Shit tanked. At the same time, like Trevor Lawrence scoring twenty points in a game seems far fetched against Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey. They're Rams. Give me the Rams. I mean, scoring 20 points any game this season has been a bit of a grind. What have they? They've not scored more than 23, I want to say, in any single game. Yeah. Which is... Whew. Tell me why the Baltimore... That was not a fart. That was an adjustment on the <laughs> chair. so loud. <laughs> that was a fart. I would admit to it. That was not. Jags at Rams. Or no. Ravens at Steelers. Discombobulated. Mm -hmm. Why is this line so small? I know it's on the road. And I know it's a divisional matchup. But shouldn't the Ravens boat race the Steelers? Why are the Steelers still getting love? No, I'm taking the Steelers here. Really? At home. Have you seen the Ravens offensive late? We, I talked about in the last pod. The Lamar Jackson's passing grades hasn't been above 65 and five Does it games. need to be? I think so. I mean, the Steelers, for as much as they got gashed against the Bengals, like this still is a talented defense. They still have the dudes to slow down Lamar Jackson. Um, yeah, give me the Steelers. And, and for Big Ben's awful shortcomings like making bad decisions against the blitz is not one of them like he's not like I, i'm gonna say this he's gonna throw like five picks this weekend but like wink martindale and the stuff he does with the zeros and the like exotics are not going to necessarily fool ben roethlisberger i'll just say like that that works against the young quarterbacks of the world the inexperienced guys ben ben's seen it all 
Like he just throws picks. Oh, he's seen arms, it all. His arms toast, you know? Yeah. And these receivers are good in Pittsburgh. I'm still taking Ravens minus four. Okay. 49ers, Seahawks. This is another game that I was kind of surprised at the line. I believe I have this misprinted in the dock. It is yeah, 49ers. 49ers on the road, favored by three and a half over Seattle. I think the market's still overvaluing Seattle. They're overvaluing how healthy Russell Wilson is and how much this team can bounce back. Right? Well, at like, this is point, this... His, his finger's going to heal at some point now. But if you keep working it, like, is it going to heal? I don't know. Your, your dad's a doctor. Get him on the show. I think the market's still overvaluing the Seahawks. The Seahawks have been dreadful this year, both sides of the ball. I think I'm taking Niners minus three and a half. Yeah, I am also taking Niners minus three and a half in this one. Yeah, it's on the road. But Seahawks offense is putrid at this point. Just not, can't take advantage of what the 49ers are going to bring to the table. My, my take on the Niners is that they aren't a legit deep postseason contender. Thank you. But, Captain Obvious. But... They're playing well of late, right? And they could make seek their way yeah. in the postseason. Jimmy Garoppolo, I think, since week six is one of the highest grade quarterbacks in the NFL. Are you buying them at all as this team that can get in the playoffs and do some damage? I mean, some of the stuff Shanahan does in the run game is sweet. When they bring Kyle Juszczyk on jet motion and have him lead runs out front is just – that's innovative. Like, yeah. Have you seen that anywhere else in the NFL? That stuff is cool. Um, and they've been rolling on the ground. And Elijah Mitchell has – legit home runs or speed we just talked about him in the draft process like this guy had the best athletic testing of any running back in this class um so that's a good combo good run block and an athlete behind him that's kind of been the 49ers mo which was made so head scratching when they fucking traded up and draft trade sermon in the third round broncos at chiefs i don't know why they went with this game on sunday night why wasn't this chargers Bengals? Sh- look, yeah, just look spread wise nine and a half point game versus three point chiefs game. are favored by nine I, and a half of the broncos you know why though Mahomes factor. Well, I was just going to say fan bases. Like Broncos and Chiefs fan bases compared to the Chargers and Bengals fan base. Not to hate. But Cincinnati is one of the smallest markets in the NFL. And Chargers are notoriously small fan base. So that is why. Plus, how how is everyone going to know that Mahomes had a no-look throw? It's true. Unless unless we saw it on Sunday Night Football. No one would ever retweet it otherwise unless it was in primetime. Don't you feel this line is too big, though? I know it's a nine and a half point spread, and the Broncos' offense looked kind of shitty, but their defense has been good all year. Yeah. And I think against Kansas City, Fangio's going to dial up a jam. I don't think they win on the road, but we wouldn't be surprised if this was another sluggish game from this Chiefs' offense where they get limited a bit and still win. Yeah, I like the Broncos to cover nine and a half. I mean, sluggish game. What, like, Fangio kind of, his defense has been the blueprint for yeah. Chiefs' offense. Like, that is how they've kind of gotten by and you're like how everyone's attacked them is by using kind of the concepts that Fangio I don't want to say pioneered obviously this shit's been around for a while but that he's been employing for years at the NFL level so that is why I also lead Broncos cover last game here then we get to the mailbag and the trivia this might be the game of the week yeah this one's very good for a Monday Night Football matchup Patriots very, at very Bills good. Bills favored by two and a half at home do we get Manning cast this week we better Ooh. get Manicast for this. You like the Manicast over the regular bra? I like it when they don't have a person on. Oh, or yeah. if sometimes when they have a, like when Brady was on and they were actually looking at the plays, like when it's an NFL guy and they can actually talk about what's going on in the field, that's enjoyable. But when it's John Stewart, I don't know, like some, someone who's not watching the game, or I guess John Stewart was, he was watching the Giants, but like who else have they had on where it's just like, it breaks, Brett Favre. and then it's not even enough. Yeah, shit. Brett Favre, Favre was, had no barely knew a game was on. on. Yeah, like that was bad. Like that was objectively bad content. Or not not bad content, but it was bad game watching. I would have watched it on its own, on a separate thing, but not while this game's going on. I want to watch. So we don't get man and cast. Fuck. We do not get. Oh no. We will get man and cast. Don't tease me. Like we will that. get man and cast. We will get man and cast. All right, good. Man we'll, and cast. we'll have to see who the guests are because I agree. When the guests come on, it usually is kind of stink, mm-hmm. kind of stink, kind of stink. Patriots at Bills. Okay, who you got? This one's a pick 'em largely, right? Two and a half points at home is kind of, you know, pick your poise. Mm-hmm. I think Bill Belichick on defense is playing or coaching lights out, and offensively. While this defense for the Bills is good, like this is two of the best defenses in the NFL. Yeah. The two best defenses in the NFL. I lean Belichick in that matchup, right? I lean Belichick over McDermott in a defensive battle, an absolutely defensive battle to limit Josh Allen, to limit this offense. So much that I think it's a low scoring game. Mm-hmm. I think it goes under the total, but I also think that the Patriots win. I like the Patriots to win as well. Um, I think they have the sort of 
in a lot of even sort of matchups, I think they have the one trump card, which is a running game. They will be able to run the ball in Bills, I believe. Their offensive line is a top Their three line's unit in the NFL. A, a, a unit, a horse. Um, and I think that's big. And I think Notre Davis White's going to have monster impact Huge. on this defense. Monster impact, sadly. Before we get into the mailbag here, football fans, I'm sure you love an action packed, high scoring NFL game. But with the latest no brainer from DraftKings, DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, you'll be a winner once a single point is scored. New customers who bet just $1 on any NFL team to score can win $100 in free bets. It's that simple. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still get in on the NFL action. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes all season long with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports Contest. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF. Bet $1 on any NFL team to win, to score, and win $100 in free bets. If they score, you score with promo code PFF this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 years or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Minimum $5 deposit. $1 wager required. One per customer. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem. Call 1-800-GAMBLER. First mailback question comes from Super Sandy Finland 78 There better be no redacted list in this one, Max. <laughs> Every name gets its due. Apple Podcasts, why is he first? Because he went to Apple Podcasts, left a five-star review. You love to see it. Yeah. Thoughts on Sean Tucker, Noah Sewell, and Nick Benito. Sean Tucker's Twitter, by the way, is phenomenal. Oh, it's the best. Very pleased with this performance. He's running back for Syracuse. It is phenomenal. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, go pull up one of his tweets and read it out after I'm done right. talking about this. But odd question here. Um, these guys are – I can't think of a thread that relates these three. Because um, Sean Tucker, Syracuse running back, true sophomore. Noah Sewell, Oregon linebacker, true sophomore. Nick Benito, uh, Oklahoma edge defender, redshirt junior. Only one of them draft eligible. But let's get into it. Big Sean Tucker guy. Big Sean Tucker guy. I think he could be... Built like a bowling ball. RB3 behind Tank Bigsby. Tank Bigsby? Next year? B. John Robinson. Those are probably one and two. But Sean Tucker, I like... I'm a fan of yoked running backs. He this is yoked. dude is yoked. His arm's like... Massive. Looks like a. you saw this guy in the gym, you'd be terrified because you wouldn't sit next to him on the bench. You just wouldn't. You'd, he's also been super productive, right? I mean, he's yeah, been Syracuse's. I'm ridiculously productive. I think his first nine games this year, he won over 100 yards rushing. So he's a, he's a dude, big fan of his. Um, Noah Sewell is still a little work in progress -y. Traits are there. He reminds me a little of Micah Parsons stylistically shall we say. I'm not going to put the Michael Parsons comp, but he's uh -oh. a super explosive, super good downhill, blitzing, taking on blocks, blowing up running backs in the hole. Perfect. Don't have to worry about him in that regard. Coverage? Uh, uh, we'll see. So that's how I feel about Noel Sewell at this point, but he's a Sewell. He's a freak of nature. He'll probably be drafted fairly highly. Benito, last one. Oklahoma Edge, only one who's drafted eligible, like I said. He's still, and we talked about this on the last one, he's still too small. Like You don't see a lot of bull rush. You don't see power on his tape. And that's fine. You can still be productive at the NFL level. Um, he can be a Yannick Ngakwe type, but it just gets far more difficult to do so at the NFL level. You have to have, you have to be very, very good with your hands, with your pass rush plan. And he, he is good with his pass rush plan. I just still think he still needs a little more Meat. Meat. A little more meat. Sean Tucker, Twitter, October 31. Another ACC win, Syracuse 21, BC 6. I'm pleased with my performance and the outcome of the game. I had 26 attempts for 270 yards and a TD. He's like magic. With yes. A, with a Every, everyone, has the same, uh, everyone has the same format. With a much-needed bye week and three games left, I plan to finish strong. Then the next week, we lost Saturday, Louisville, to Syracuse 3. I'm okay with my performance. But I wanted to do more. He didn't say please. Yeah. I'm not happy he, with the yes, outcome, yeah. so I plan to grind harder this week. I had 19 attempts for 95 yards, two games left, and I'm still in the fight. Then this is my favorite. We lost Saturday and oh no, the next one, sorry. We lost Saturday, NC State 41, Syracuse 17. I'm pleased with my performance, but not happy with the outcome. With 13 attempts for 105 yards in TD, there was so much more I could do, whatever. But then, most recently on the 29th, we lost our game, pit 31, Syracuse 14. I'm not pleased with the outcome of the game or the play calling. I wanted to do so much more, but I don't call the plays. Good luck to all the seniors moving on. Oh, it, my it, gosh. You know what it is reads he a transfer? like? He, I think he is. I think I did see something about how he is. I, I don't know if Possibly. it's official. Poor also, guy. you know what you need to do? You know how, Austin, sometimes you watch film with some of these prospects? You need to watch film with Sean Tucker. Please or not please. 
get well no get him to like tweet out instead of like reading instead of responding directly to you he just tweets out his thoughts on what you I guys love are that. watching I literally love that we're gonna that get Sean on the call ASAP his, they also fire their offense coordinator after that game this reads like he has to keep a running journal for like a school project yes you know? <laughs> this it's is what I would write if I'd I love her, I'd love to know if he gets the bit or not right I don't know like he has to he has to he has, he has to. to this is from AG888 on Apple Podcasts. Have you gotten a chance to look at Mozzie Smith or Chris Hinton? I work for Michigan as an interior defensive line manager and wonder what you think of them since the edges get most of the love. So Hinton, I was less than enthused about. I had actually had not watched until I watched either until Solid I question. got asked this question. So thank you for asking this question. Love to see it. But was not impressed with Hinton. Uh, he's not particularly twitchy. He's got a nice, he's got an NFL build. He'll probably play in the NFL. He's 6'4", 3'10", long arms. Below average twitch, okay anchor, plays a little high. I was not impressed. I'm not enthused. Um, Smith, on the other hand, I believe is a redshirt sophomore. I would be surprised if he doesn't come back to school, honestly. But this guy can play in the NFL. This guy can be a difference maker in the league. Uh, he's 326 pounds, 6'3". Watching them both on tape, you notice like a night and day difference between their pad level and the run game. Smith just... He fires off much lower, and he moves blockers into the backfield much easier. He is a much more explosive athlete at that size. Um, bull rushes on tape are very impressive. That's like a very good starting point for any defensive lineman. That means you got the overpowering guys. means like you'll be able to hold up to NFL caliber physicality. Um, but like I said, probably still a guy who I would assume comes back to school, still kind of unpolished, could – could be like a you know could get up into a real deal draft prospect with another year in my opinion this is from bode 808 on apple Podcasts. any hawaii prospects for 2022 calvin turner accepted an invite to the east west shrine bowl yes he'll be at the side shrine bowl we'll be at the shrine bowl he's probably the most impressive he probably is he is also a flawed dude i mean he goes Small. he has the worst hands he has yeah, the worst oh hands does he I've seen. you think he's got the worst hands Night the worst hands of any of like the wide receivers I studied so far. There's 19 drops on 126 catches. I've never seen that, right? That's almost a 20%. Rate. And he is not, and he's like catching screens. 126 catchable of those, I believe like a third or so are screens. He's not, it's not like he's jumping up for goes and posts and dropping these balls. They are a lot of easy ones on his tape. Now he's elusive, somewhat sudden, interesting sort of prospect, but man, those hands. Plays the bulk majority in the slot, 5'11", 195, yeah. a ton of drops. But 19 drops on that many catchable passes, that's insane. That's one of the highest rates we'll see. I've never, and in 4 of 12 in contested catch situations. Yeah, his ball skills are just, yeah. That's rough. Very much, actually, so the worst, oh gosh, what was his name? The worst drop rate we've ever seen at the NFL level was also a Hawaii wide receiver that I can now not remember his name. Played for the Browns, dropped every pass in like 2013. I have no idea. Browns fans will know. Tell me. Browns fans hit me Devon up. Devon Bess. Yep, Devon Bess. Devon Bess. Also played for Miami for a little bit. That was more my time. There you go. Ajax1624 on Apple Podcast. Does PFF do any grading for FCS? Who are draft prospects to watch in the FCS? Here's a take. North Dakota State receiver Christian Watson is the most talented player in the FCS playoffs, including Ooh. Pierre Strong. We do grade the FCS. Yes. And you can get FCS grading with your college football subscription on PFF.com. And you can save 40% off with Cyber 40. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, Pierre Strong's a probably the best running back prospect in the FCS level. Fan of his. Uh, there's a lot of offensive linemen that are already invited to Penning. Shrine Bowls, Senior Bowls. Penning actually hasn't even accepted an invite. Really? Yet, I believe, to either. Um, so, Trevor Penning, the Northern Iowa offensive tackle, top 50 on the PFF draft board, top, uh, shit, he was top 10 on Dane Brugler's draft board. Like, he is high, people are high in him. He's got the physicality to be a first rounder. Some other names of offensive linemen that have already accepted Cordell Volson from North Coast State's going to the Shrine Bowl. And then you got Braxton Jones from Southern Utah, Cole Strange from UT Chattanooga, Nick Zakelli? Zakelj. Zakelj from Fordham, and Joshua Williams, who's actually a cornerback from Fayetteville State. Those guys are all accepted the Senior Bowl. Big opportunities at Senior Bowl and East West Shrine Bowls for these guys, right? Like every year there's an FCS, usually a lineman. And every year is an FCS lineman that shows up against it was Quinn Miners last year. It's been what Kappa in the past. Uh, what's his face? The oh, I guess he was D three, but Miners Barch. was D three. But Barch, Barch has been playing actually all right this year for the Jags. This is from B Wayne on Apple Podcasts. Who doesn't love chaos? 
I don't know if his voice is like that. What happens if Michigan, Alabama, Oklahoma State, and Cincinnati all lose this week? This guy is fucking. I celebrate. That's be what wise. I get yeah, Notre Dame I definitely get hammered gets it. is what I do. <laughs> Who gets in the playoff? I think you have it right here. So Georgia, obviously. Um, so Michigan, Alabama, Oklahoma State. So those are the two through five currently on the college football. You think they ranking. keep? Notre oh, Dame okay. has to get in at that point. Mm-hmm. If they didn't, I would shit my pants. So I think if Alabama keeps it close, Alabama is the one that gets in of those teams that just lost. If Mich- if Alabama's blown out and Michigan keeps it close, I think they c- keep Michigan in. I think that Baylor would jump up and get in because they would be a two loss Big Twelve champ, but then with also a one of the best quality wins of anyone outside of conference so far in college football this year with their win over BYU. So Baylor would also get in. But if Michigan gets blown out and Alabama gets blown out, then it sort of gets crazy. Oh, Miss might slip it in. Could, I mean, it could be Oregon if they win the Pac-12 championship. Oh, wow. Could slip in there. San Diego State even. No. All right. Now we're getting crazy. <laughs> you want chaos. Yeah. All right, this is from Jackboy512. I feel like all these names are the same. Are all their names the same? <laughs> One was AG888, which is your initial, so. A lot of knocks on Herbert. This is from Jackboy512 on Apple P. A lot of knocks on Herbert coming out of Oregon was his lack of aggressiveness. Analysts chalked it up to play calling in Oregon. Is his conservative play due to scheme or just who he is, despite his tools? I think he's a little conservative, I, I, but I still think he's far more willing to attack downfield to less favorable situations now with talent he has trusting guys like mike williams keenan allen than he was at any point in the past like he's even this past week even when he was you know notoriously one of his worst games he still had throws where it was like one-on-one back shouldering a guy 25 yards downfield like he still which like it's not open got throw him open he was still doing that i still think the average at the target stuff the you know completions in front of the stick stuff is still a product of that offense to a large, large degree. This was a Joe Lombardi that got Matt Stafford, a similarly tooled quarterback, to average 6.9 yards, average up target in 2015. Made Calvin Johnson retire after that year because he didn't want to play anymore in that offense. I'm kidding about that. That's not anywhere near related. But Calvin Johnson was in that offense, still average 6.9 yard average up target. And his career average up target is 8.5. So it was, this is a offense that throws short. That is what it's predicated on. So... That's a big reason. On to Conrad Smart. Last mailbag question. We're going to get into more mailbags, right? Once we get into the offseason, we go out to four episodes of the bonus mailbag episode. Yes, sir. Conrad Smart. Could you please, this is from Twitter. Could you please explain why it's entirely possible that a player will have a season grade higher than any individual single game grade he achieved because playing well for an extended period of time is harder to do than for a short period? So he's asking about the concept. And this is something we get a lot here at PFF with kind of hard grades to set up about how a guy can have like 75, 77, 78, 80, 74, 70, like an 60, and then finish the year at 90.1. It's like, how does that work? And I think the best sort of example for this is to say that is this thought uh, experiment. 300 yards passing. If a guy has 300 yards passing in a single game. Is that an exceptional game to you? No. It's good. It's a good game. Good game. 300 yards passing for a season is an exceptional season. Yeah. It's 4,800 yards. 17 that's, games, it's 5,100 yards. That's, yeah. So that is that is the best way to look at it is that being slightly above average in one game isn't anything that off the charts. Like I said, 300 yards isn't anything off the charts. If you're slightly above average in every game. If you're slightly above average in every single game where that's what your base is for the season – then that's a much different animal. I think it's also important, too, to talk about how these grades, like the 0-100 grades, aren't opponent-adjusted on the front end, right? We do, do we do a lot of opponent-adjusting for the grades behind the scenes to find more you know, predictive power in these things, and that's what some of the NFL teams look for. But 0-100 grades on PFF.com right now are not adjusted for opponent, and you can see... You, know, you can see why, like, oh, my God. Yeah, he graded 85.4, but he was doing it against the butt chase Eagles or whatever, and it's like, why do I have to say Eagles? Lions. <laughs> He's doing it against the Eagles. Why does that matter? It's like, okay, these are against San Diego not, State. You, you do 300 yards a game and say you played San Diego State every single week. And I was you're like, God. I think of a bad team. I can think of a bad oh, team. Okay. Uh, Akron, every single week, you're a God. You're an yeah. absolute God. 
Trivia season. What do we got? Yeah. So speaking of San Diego State, oh. I, I got to bring this up. I got to bring up Austin's desire to want to go to a basketball game in Ann Arbor. And it's too bad that you guys are going to Indy for the Big Ten Championship. Because there's one game. this weekend. Because, yeah, Saturday, December 4, 1 p.m., number 24 Michigan is at home against San Diego State. San Diego State. We're not going to be there. Yeah, I wish I could go. Yeah, you could change the tailgate tour. I hate to see Should it. Should we do it right now? Yeah. Should we tell the Big Ten title? Steve Fisher Bowl. What, what, what do I want to go see Michigan for? Who do I? I'm kidding. I, I, uh, that'd probably be awesome day. It, they College kids probably get up, go to the basketball game, yeah, or go to the bars, and then just keep sick. it buzzing it be, until 8 p.m. That's probably the boys, an awesome day. For lack of better phrasing, would be buzzing. Yeah. I think if we went to that. So that's a shame. All right. Well, we're getting right into the trivia now. Um, our boy Perk Angel is back. I love him. Uh, six Heisman winners have been selected number two overall in the draft. Name the three since 2000. Number two overall. He's getting oh nuts now. Six Heisman winners, number two overall. Wow. RG3. Yeah. Well done. Hmm. Just thinking of the number two overall picks. It's tough. Calvin Johnson? Did he win a Heisman? No. Negative. Heisman winner. Marcus Mariota? Marcus Mariota. God, you're killing this. Hmm. I can't even think of It's got to be another QB. Picks. It's not another QB. Ooh. It's probably... Charles Woods? No, he was... Negative. He was 98. 2000. Yeah. Um, it's probably a running back. I mean, because it's... That's who else wins. Uh, Terry so, McFadden? He didn't win. Nah, he, he was number four overall. High. I'm trying to think who's a running back. It's got to be in like the mid-2000s, I'm guessing. I have no idea. Yep. Let, let, me, let me think. I'm thinking... I gotta come up with something to do when you're just shit at this. I'll get one. Uh, Five running backs that four, went two overall. Three. Trent Richardson. He didn't go number two. Negative. Well, who is it? Some might say he doesn't even have a Heisman. It's Reginald uh, Rich Bush. Bush. Oh, man. Yeah, Rich Reginald Bush. So I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess technically that's an inaccurate yeah, question because he doesn't question. really have a Heisman. Scratch it. Wow, yeah, Perk Angel it. letting us down again. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Perk Angel. Piece of shit. Uh, tailgate is headed to Indy for the well maybe you guys are headed to Indy maybe you guys are headed to Ann Arbor for a basketball team TBD. Uh, for the Big Ten Championship game between number two Michigan and number 13 Iowa this is the Wolverines first appearance in the title game but the second for the Hawkeyes who last made it in 2015 name the team that they lost to that year in the QB for that team Michigan State Connor Coke Connor Coke yeah, that was easy. That was yeah. a layup. I thought that was going to be a little Utter, bit more of a struggle. Connor Cook, former Raiders ledge. Oh, yeah, he was a Raider. Did he Raiders go kind of high? Yeah, he went to the top of the second round, right? State snuck in. That was the team that benefited from Notre Dame shit in the bet against Stanford. State snuck in. And, and they then got, got absolutely boat raced. Yeah. One of the worst against guys. Bama on New Year's yeah. Day. Happy New Year's. You're trash. Yeah. Uh, I watched that from Miami. First time I did New Year's in Miami. Uh, Mike, know your co-host. What was my go-to? Wait, was that it? Was that no, it? we got one more. Oh, oh shit, I'm an idiot. Jesus. Uh, last time Michigan and pace. Iowa won the Big Ten was 2004 when they shared the title. Name the QB and the leading wide receiver for the Wolverines that season. Ooh. Um, 2004? Leading wide receiver, Braylon Edwards. Yeah. Nice. Who was his QB? John Navarre. Negative. Oh. Who? Wait. Ned, you're not going to guess him. Long time uh, NFL QB. Legend. I don't, maybe he's still playing. I'm not sure. Chad Henney. Chad Henney. Yeah. Wow. Is he still nice. playing ball? Is he I didn't still know Chad Henney bled blue. You didn't know Chad Henney? Yeah. He was good in college. When was John Navarre there? Now I got Also, Braylon Edwards is a bodybuilder now. Oh, really? Yeah. I can see that. Google that. All right. Uh, know your co host. You go first. Um, my front two teeth are fake. What? Not real. You know. Really? That. Yeah. Do you take them out at night and shit? No. Oh. How did I knock them out? You were. Eat it. Uh, um, you're on a skateboard and you turfed it into the cement. Nope. I jumped on a moving treadmill when I was 10 years old. Idiot. Yeah. Oh, Name one so person who enjoyed a jumping on a moving treadmill. Name one. I I, so I did it once and then I didn't fall. And you then I cranked up. You... I did it once at like a lowish speed and I didn't fall. And I cranked up to the highest speed and I've aged. You cranked, you cranked to the highest speed? Yes. And I was at a friend's house. I thought it was cool. Um, Dude, that must have cool. hurt. It hurt like hell. I had been I was cr yeah, it was bad. That sounds awful. What was my uh, go-to drink in college? Navarre was 2003, last year. I was so close. Uh, go-to drink in college, uh, four local gold. Oh, my God. I'm not a fucking monster. <laughs> it's Cassidy Coke. Not even Diet Coke? 
explains uh, it. No, that, I feel like that's pretty standard. Yeah, Captain Coke. Captain Coke, Jack and Coke, yeah. Long Island iced tea. I never did Long Island iced teas. We they used to it. drink, this was, they were called 69ers, which was Captain Coke and then Peach Schnapps, and it was fucking bomb. That sounds actually pretty fire. Yeah. I made one time. But then you do Diet Coke, so you get a little less sugar. I, yeah, Cap- I was in a Captain and DP phase for a little bit. Yeah. And I did a Captain. A no, a Captain and Root Beer phase. Okay. And I tried to do a Captain and Root Beer float. Like ice cream, it was the worst fucking. Thing <laughs> but like, it made the ice cream taste like complete ass. It, yeah. Like I thought it was gonna be fucking those. Sick. It was for Halloween. It was terrible. Those like boozy ice cream shit. You don't mix them. No, just let me have don't. a normal milkshake don't. and I'll do a shot on the side. What's your right. go-to drink right now, Miller? A Miller Lite. Yeah, Miller Lite. Miller Lite. All right, that's gonna do it for this episode of the Tailgate. Just kidding. Interviews with Auburn cornerback Roger McCreary and UAB edge Alex Wright. Let's get to those. Now joining the Tailgate Podcast is current Auburn cornerback Roger McCreary, a Mobile, Alabama native, and also you recently accepted your invite to the Senior Bowl, man. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much for that. That's going to be a really, really good opportunity for you to elevate your 2022 NFL draft stock, an already high NFL you know, draft stock. You're already a top 20 player on PFS draft board. Going into the Senior Bowl, what are some of your goals? What are some of the expectations going into the one-on-ones, the practices, et cetera? Um, first, um, I was very excited for being uh, invited to the Senior Bowl because I've been um, dreaming of that since I was a little child. Um, I always went to the practice to watch one on one as a father to be a part of that. I'm very excited for it, and that's what I'm looking forward to to playing this different competition that I've never seen before. So that's that's what I'm really happy for to be back home and playing the sport that I love. Before we, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the offseason and draft prep, all that stuff. You'll have all offseason to do that. I want to focus on this past season. This past season, an 89.9 PFF grade for here, for us here at PFF. And you've improved your grade in PFF's charting every single year of your career at Auburn, all the way up to what has been a career for, year for you in 2021. Haven't allowed more than 100 yards in any game this season. Where would you say your game has improved the most over the course of this four-year span? Um, I feel like I took it step by step, like every every year as it went by. My freshman year, that was like my hardest year. I had to get, I had to get like comfortable with knowing what's coming. I had to know what's like how the game go at college mm-hmm. football. So I feel like when Coach Steele put me that far a little bit, my freshman year, I feel like it was great for me. So I can like get that little get that little moment of playing in a in university. So when my sophomore year came, it was just all about me just trying to step up and be that that next cornerback. And I feel like I did great with that and. The most thing I uh, executed the most at was man, because that's all we played was man. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I did good with that my freshman, year, I mean, my sophomore year, and my junior year. It was still man, you know, on Coach Dale. So, but it was me learning more football IQ. So I feel like I had to learn that more. And when I got to my senior season, I knew we were gonna play zone more. So I felt like I got better, like we're playing zone, because I never played it before, like my whole college career. And finally, my last season, I get to play it more. I feel like I improved at that more in my football IQ because. Coach Mason, he always pressure on us about like football IQ, like learning the plays, mm-hmm. um, pre snap awareness, and everything. So I felt like as the year went on, I improved at every little stuff every year. Do you like playing man coverage or zone coverage more? I feel like man to man, it's more physical, it's more one on one, it's alpha versus alpha. But in zone, you you get way more opportunities for hands on the ball, get way more opportunities for picks and those things. Which one do you like more? Um, I would say I like man more because that was our like. That's why I first came to college playing, so I always love playing man. But zone, it's not really that bad, too. Like, I, I love playing zone, too. So either way, I love playing both in the future. Yeah, I think being a versatile corner is something you see on your tape, very smooth corner. I want to know more about what you do in, in practice and what you do in the game, you know, practice leading up. What is your film study habits right now? When are you turning on the film for your opponent first in the week? What are you looking for specifically, all that stuff? Um, first, I look at, like, their main top receiver. Like every week, who their main top receiver, who the person they pass to on third down. And I just look at his releases. That was all about learning releases. You can't play every receiver the same. So during that whole week, uh, like that Sunday, I will look at his releases and stuff. Then around that time, I would try to learn like my new technique of what I'm trying to go against his new release. Or when you're playing off, like how you release when you're playing off, I try to learn my different technique with that. I really try to do different technique every week. But mostly it'd be soft shoe or hands on, most physical, because some receivers don't like when mm-hmm. coming with their hands on. That's why I like playing man more. So that's how my progress of the whole week goes, looking at the receiver releases, 
um, recognize the formation or when they're going to give that receiver the ball and stuff. So that's what it's all about, that number one receiver. Who who are some receivers that come to mind as some of the biggest challenges you've faced in your college career? Um, college career? Mm-hmm. Um, like you know, the top five or something, or just just say yeah. Any any five. names you have? Any names where you look, you go back and you're like, man, that guy, you know, gave me some of the you know some of the best challenges in my career. Um, I would start out first with my first biggest challenge was Jamar Chase. That was my sophomore year on Devontae Smith. That was my junior year, and I say the biggest challenge was this year. I say was was matching in the game. Yeah, and then Trey Lamb Burks. I I can see he he's a good guy too. That's what I go against and Jahad Dotson. Mm-hmm. Those are all really, really talented receivers, yeah, man. You've had too. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> it was, I mean, that is, you know, when playing in the SEC, playing at Auburn, you get such a unique opportunity to go against some of the top competition: Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, Traylon Burks. I'm sure that has helped you a ton in this process to improve every single week. What about some of the guys you've played at Auburn, though? Auburn has put out some good receiver talent as well. Oh yeah, um, like. With that, um, like I, I came here with the fastest person, like at, at our age, Anthony Schwartz. So like when when I was going against speed receiver during the game, mm-hmm. I already seen speed because I go against <laughs> Anthony Schwartz every week. So like that's how I looked at it, and I was so thankful that he was my teammate because I see it every practice, every time we do a go ball. Mm-hmm. And another receiver, self, you know, self, when he was a big guy, that was my best friend. So like we always had competition together every time. I, I never seen like he. I never seen nobody move like him, like a big guy who can run yeah. and move the directions. He helped me my first year. Darren Slayton, he was good with too. So it really, it really like was a lot of Auburn people that helped me throughout that whole week. So I, you know, I, I got to work on my technique. So I had to do it on them first, and I feel like they helped me improve like on Saturdays. Saturdays. That, that's that's phenomenal, man. How about? Um your leadership, right? I mean, you've been such a big leader on this team, having been there for so long, and obviously one of the most talented players on this defense. How how excited are you for this next wave of Auburn talent to take over some of that leadership? And I guess speak to the leadership style that you've had over you know in, this past season with Auburn. Um, like how I say my leader on stage, I feel like I, I lead by example. Like I'm not a person that talk like more like a lot mm-hmm. on the field, so I like to lead by example, and that's what. My young classmate look at me as a person who lead by example. But um, coming in, like, we had all types of leaders. Derrick Brown, like, I, I seen, like, how it was, like, leaders supposed to lead in the Auburn football mm-hmm. team. And I felt like they, they was one of the great leaders of my time playing at Auburn. And I felt like um this game, like, this last game, like, I feel like it was the best. Obviously, Auburn playing, like, this whole season. And I feel mm-hmm. like, like the young guys, they can see, like, how – it's supposed to be like every game, no matter what, who we play against. And I'm happy that we went through that hard adversity because they know how it's supposed to be on for now and continue even after the bowl game. Uh, I've got one more question for you, Roger, and I'll let you go. Really appreciate the time. Looking ahead to this offseason, what are some of the biggest goals you have in this pre draft process? Obviously, going to the senior bowl and showing out there, but do you have combine goals? Do you have these different things that you have top of mind on your sticky notes or on your notes app that you're thinking about as you go into this offseason? Um, I don't have like the goal like individual like you know process, but like I have like I have my little list. Um, senior bowl, I want to do great at that. My little off season workout training or whatever I'm training at, I want to crush that every day. And mm-hmm. um, pro day, I want to crush that. Combine, it, I don't have like the little goals in it, but that's the overall goal I want to achieve of me like getting drafted high. Well, I wish you the best of luck in your pre-draft process. We'll be down there in Mobile. Maybe we can catch up in person when we get get, get down there. But, Roger, really appreciate the time, and, and thanks again for jumping on. Yes, sir. Thanks so much. Welcome into Tailgate UAB Edge. Alex Wright joining the show today. Also, PFF's Conference USA Defensive Player of the Year. Alex, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. You, your career at UAB has been very impressive. Even as a true freshman, you got snaps right away. I think you played over 200 snaps as a true freshman and graded in the high 70s with PFF and followed that up in 2020, what was obviously a COVID-impacted, COVID-abbreviated season. But this year, you completely flipped the script. 91.3 PFF grade, 48 total pressures, easily the best in the Conference USA. What, what all you know, factors into that massive leap you took this year? Uh, I just changed up my... Um just my day-to-day routine, you know, it's just changing my mindset, just mental, thinking about the more mental, the more physical compared to what I did the last two years. And I just started taking everything into perspective, 
not like I used to do when I was a freshman or a sophomore. I started taking things more clear, more day by day, just taking little stuff one day at a time, just, you know, just just perfect, uh, perfecting my craft, just switching up anything when it came to like eating more or watching more film, doing more off the field work, uh, doing more on the field work after practice, before practice, uh, you know, just that, just that type of stuff. You know, I just started mainly just taking stuff more, I just take the small parts more, more critical than I did, you know? So that came with, that came with whether it was practice, I took one play, I started off so big from one period to another period to that play to that play, you know, I just start, I stop, you know, I stop worrying about stuff, more stuff that I would usually worry about and I would just go on to the next play. That was, that was what I mainly like focused on was just taking stuff just play by play and just playing as hard as I can to each play, so. It's all the little things, right? As you focus on the little things, they will take care of the big things as you go. I think that's something that everyone, even regardless if you play football, should take in their daily routine. And you mentioned eating, right? I'd be interested to know what your diet is like. Listen at six foot seven, 270. How many calories are you putting on a day? What are you currently weighed out right now? And is there a goal weight you're trying to get to? Uh, my goal weight right now is really about the same. I, w- I would say 275, but it mm-hmm. depends if I'm comfortable at that weight. But yeah. My- my diet, me growing up in the South, it was always, you know, the sweet teas, the the, <laughs> the chicken, the barbecues, you know. And then when I moved up here, like I added more of that on, but I started eating more baked food, more uh, less fried food, uh, you know, just adding more, you know, expanding my horizons. Cause me as myself, like as big as I am, I'm a picky eater. So, oh really? Yeah, so I'll strictly, I will strictly eat chicken every day of the week if I was really <laughs> So I, I really have spent my horizon, you know, started eating more salads, eating more greens, you know. That's how I was when I, when I was, like I said, like when I was picky, like when I was growing up, I wouldn't eat broccoli unless it had cheese on <laughs> Same. I Honestly, I was the same way. So I would never eat, you know, I would never eat uh, asparagus, green beans. I would never eat any of that. Like, I would just strictly stay with like broccoli and stuff like that. So I started spending everything, uh, exploring more options, more food, because coming from my small town, I don't have as much, you know, diversity type of foods. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So the more I started checking that stuff out, the better it started. It better, the better, like it helped out my body, and the better I felt. So that's how. That's how. That's pretty much how I looked at it. The diet part of it. So, wait, what? I have two questions off that. What is your go-to way to prepare chicken? if you were gonna do it every single day in a week? And then also, what is your favorite meal if you had to pick one meal forever? If I had to pick one meal, that's, that's hard. Um, <laughs> Broccoli and cheese? Uh, I use that for side. If yeah, I was yeah. eating chicken, yellow rice, broccoli with cheese, a uh, roll on the side, or I had to pick between like the pasta side of where I go towards like chicken Alfredo. Oh or yeah. Chicken. I had I went I went through that phase for I say that was probably my phase at the beginning of the year chicken alfredo. I Hell used yeah! To, I used to stay like cooking that, but that's pretty much I say that's probably my go-to. But like go-to, I probably I probably switch it up. I go from fried to fried to bake to you know bake to fried, and then probably on the weekend like on Sunday I probably throw on the grill and probably just grill it up. So hell yeah, man. That's awesome. What was your Thanksgiving plate like? What'd you have? What was on the Thanksgiving plate? What are the go-to sides there? I have I have about three plates. About two. <laughs> so I had macaroni and cheese, dressing, uh ham, chicken, red velvet cake, pecan pie. Hell yeah. Uh I feel like I'm missing something. Devil eggs too. Devil eggs too. And then I think that was it. I think that was it. Well, we got sidetracked there, but I do love the food takes. Those are good food takes. No turkey on that plate either, which I think is overall wow. a pretty good take. I like that. Um, focusing more on this year and off the, you know, off the field you're eating and you're eating well and you've grown so much uh, off the field and what your habits are. What about on the football field? Where have you improved the most, you say, from a technique standpoint and adding pass rush moves and doing those things that everyone needs to do to take that next step as a pass rusher specifically? I feel like pass rush, my pass rush moves 
it took a big step from my last two years, a tremendous step. Whether it's just, you know, bending, whether it's flexibility, whether it's just the variety of moves that are thrown, I feel like that was probably my biggest, my biggest asset. And also my motor, my motor. I tried to uh, try to make sure, that was one thing, that was one of my biggest focuses this year was uh, changing up my motor, going every snap as, you know, as much as I can, as many times, as many reps as I can. But it's it was either those two really, but my pass rush moves has tremendously like excelled throughout the whole year. And What's it's your like, go ahead? It's it's not it's not like I um I just lost the train of thought. Um, That's on it's, me. It's, it's 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 not like it's not like you know I just stick with that one move. I could stick with that one, but I was the type if it keeps working, then I'm just gonna keep using it until they you know give me something else, but. Other than that, it's just I kept working it and kept working it to the point where I couldn't get it wrong. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, master it. Yeah, so so that's how that's how I really try to perfect it throughout practice and throughout games is just try to throw as many times, try to time it up perfect, try to, you know, make him react off me, just those type of just the, those type of uh just that work ethic. So when you're trying to prepare for an offensive tackle, what are you looking for on film in the week leading up to that to help you kind of dictate which moves you're going to go for, which counters you're going to prepare for? Oh, uh, every every tackle has their has a different set. Every every tackle doesn't always set the same. You got your you got your ones that like to be patient. You got the ones that like to get out and grab you. Like the ones that like to lunge at you. Like you know, they're all different varieties of tackles. So there's just Whatever type of tackle I'm gonna get, that's what I try to look at. I look at the tendencies, what gives away pass, what gives away run, what he's look at, his body language, his hands, what he does. Like I look at basically from the bottom all the way up, from his demeanor to what does he do? What does he do when he's in a panic mode? What does he do when he's you know going against somebody that's smaller than him, bigger than him? How how what is his mindset? That's that's what I do. Like I I go through all the games find his good plays, his bad plays. I try to find, you know, as many bad plays as I can, but you know, that's football. So I really try to just look at everything to the to the T. Yeah. Every, I think, every little detail. I think that's the only way to go, man. When you're given that opportunity to prepare that much for a single player, because it's such a one-on-one -on -one game, right? When you're playing edge, you're playing one or two tackles if you're rotating on either side. And it's like, okay, let's isolate what this guy does well, what this guy doesn't. I think you're hundred percent spot on. What's interesting is you're a lot bigger than these guys that play along the edge in college football these days. Some of these guys are six foot five, two fifty, six foot five, two forty, and making plays as pass rushers. You're up to six foot seven, two seventy, two seventy five. How do you leverage your size that is above average compared to some of these other guys to make sure that you are beating up on these dudes? I mean, it really is just the uh, I really just I don't I always been I always been the tall guy, you know, ever since I was in high school. So it's always been challenging because I won't be able to do certain things that other edge players can do. And it's like, I could do certain things that, you know, I could do things they can do. They can do things that I can't do, you know? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I, it's like, I just think about like the length of my stuff compared to other ones. So that's how, that's really what I just, just think about. I just, I just try to use every advantage that I got compared to, you know, the average edge player on the tackles. And that's, I feel like that's, that's my big part of it. That's a big, like, that's a big factor of my game. Just my length and my, uh, just my size, just length, length especially. Let's close with this. I really appreciate the time. This has been fantastic. And I know you're still considering whether or not you want to enter the draft, but you're all in like focusing on this bowl, right? You are all in on focusing on this bowl game. What are your goals to close out this season, both as a team, as a leader on this team, and then also personal goals as you enter this bowl game? Um, for the team, always just to everybody just play their hearts out. Everybody just play to the best of their abilities. And, you know, and, you know, bowl game, you know, just have fun, you know, just have fun. And for me, I feel like I just got to keep doing what I'm doing, you know, just taking one play at a time and just try to go out there. And like I said, as with the team, just play my heart out and just give it my all. And just come out with a dub. Oh, to hopefully come out with a dub, really. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Well, I really appreciate the time, Alex. This has been fantastic, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Yes, I appreciate it. Now that's going to do it for the Tailgate Podcast. Until next time, Austin Gale, Mike Kretter, we'll see you in Indy.